So I'm Stefan Karpinski. I'm one of the co-creators of the Julia programming language. Um, and it uh, fell to me back in the day. We were checking uh, code into the Julia main repo for all sorts of crazy stuff. And at some point, uh, we realized, uh, you know, we need a package manager. Um, and I had used, um, you know, Perl, CPAN, Ruby, um, various other programming languages, and, you know, decided to give something a try. Our first couple of iterations of the package manager were very similar to those. Um, they sort of did the, the globally installed shared set of packages. Um, and then, you know, we encountered various issues and there's a lot been a lot of innovation in, in other programming language ecosystems that we took as inspiration for the, the third iteration, which is what was released and included in Julia 1.0. Um, and I'm, I'm going to start out with a little demo because I feel like, you know, people may not be familiar with Julia and its package manager. So getting a feel for these things and how they look is always a good way to start. Um, so um, there's the Julia REPL. People do a lot of work in the REPL. Um, some people like to improve the quality of the REPL. So I'm going to try installing a package here called Oh My REPL. And it prompts you helpfully, do you want to install it? And then goes ahead and installs all the packages you need. Um, and now one of the things that it does is it it colorizes, it syntax highlights your code in the REPL. So that's, that's pretty cool and fancy. But let's take a look at the actual uh, code of Oh My REPL itself. So to do that, we'll install a de development copy. We installed an immutable you know, package for normal usage. But if you want a, de a development copy, you can do this dev command in the package manager. So the package manager has its own REPL mode you'll see here. Um, sorry. Uh, uh, this is not going so well there. Um, the, this is a pre-recorded video, but the playback controls are very bad. Um, I guess the best thing to do is just let it go. Um, so there's a lot of different REPL modes in uh, Julia. So this is the normal Julia REPL mode that you see here. Um, but it can prompt you and you have interactive editing. Um, the next REPL mode you'll see is the package manager REPL mode, where it tells you what uh, environment you're in and then lets you enter commands, which have their own syntax. Um, We're almost back to where we started, and then I swear I won't touch anything. Uh, so that's the package manager REPL mode. Um, and it's Git cloning and installing in your development directory the, uh, the package that you develop. There's a shell REPL mode, which lets you enter shell commands. So um, I can CD into that directory. Uh, we can see what's in there. Um, and that's that's the contents of the pa of the oh my REPL package, um, and then I'm going to use VS Code to take a look at it. Look at some of the content. You can see there's a README, um, pretty normal stuff. It says a little bit about what the package does. Um, now the things we're really interested in. So this, there's source code as usual. There's an entry point for loading the package, and you'll see that among other things, it uh, has some import statements. Um, and there's two types of import in Julia. There's the import where you use the import keyword, which imports specific names. Uh, and then there's using, which uh, imports a bunch of names. It's a little bit like um, import from, you know, star from in Python, but less, less dangerous and a little more reasonable. Um, but what we're really interested in is this, this project file. Um, and it describes the pro this project, and it has its name, oh my REPL, and then it has a UUID, which identifies it, and we'll talk a lot about that. And then it has a section on dependencies. These are all the dependencies that the oh my REPL package is allowed to load and knows how to use. Um, and those are what we saw the imports for in the source uh, entry point. Um, there's also this manifest file, which has you know the Julia version and the manifest format at the top, but it also has all these stanzas for different dependencies. Um, and you'll see there's the UUID, that's the same UUID uh, that we would see in the project file, but there's also the tree hash there, which is the, the same type of cryptographic tree hash that Git computes um, using SHA-1. Um, we also have plans to introduce SHA-256, so all the code is pretty much the same, but for the time being, since Git is 
um, we, we kind of want to match Git for the time being. Um, okay, so these are the files that are of interest to to the package manager, the project file and the manifest file, and we'll see we'll see what their what their deal is momentarily. Um, so one obvious question is why UUIDs? Why are we using UUIDs to to identify packages? Well, so packages in general live in a you know global shared namespace that everybody shares. Um, and you know you could use names, but what if uh, you know different people disagree on what a particular name means? You need some sort of globally unique identifier to distinguish different packages across the world, and you know inside and outside of organizations potentially. So why not URLs? So this is what some other languages do. Java does you know import and you know com.sum.xml, and you see you know it's kind of a reversed URL. Uh, Go actually uses URLs without the without the schema part, um, so they don't do the reversing part because they guess they decided that was confusing. Um, so that this is a you know a well trod path. We could have done this as well. So one one problem with this is that you know URLs change. So you know Sun Microsystems doesn't exist anymore. Um, Google and Microsoft could have a spat, and Google could decide that hosting the Go CMP package on GitHub. Is something they don't want to do anymore, um, and then this URL would have to change, and you'd have to go back, and your code changes even though, you know, it shouldn't shouldn't change. It should be permanent. Um, so this, when I was thinking about this problem, it reminded me of something that I remember encountering, encountering when developing web applications and learning about database systems, um, which was a long time ago. But if you've ever used a website that won't let you change your email, it's the same problem. They someone. Someone decided that email was a good unique identifier um, and decided to identify users by their email. And then the problem with that is now you can't change the email because it's supposed to be this permanent unique identifier. So the standard solution is that you, know, you, you actually identify users by some internal ID that has no particular meaning or significance. Um, and users don't even need to know or care what the ID is because it doesn't mean anything. And then you can change their email as much as you want. You can still enforce that you know emails are unique to users or not. You can choose whether or not you want to. But um, this internal meaningless ID means we can we have some freedom here. Um, so this struck me as a very similar problem. Um, we kind of want to do the same thing to identify packages. You want a meaningless ID for each package, but you can't send, centrally coordinate this because. As we'll see later, this could be federated. I mean, I could generate a package locally and never publish it or keep it private. And I still want it to be you know, uniquely identified. So the obvious solution to this is UUIDs, universally unique IDs. There are 128-bit values. Um, we use the randomly generated variant. Uh, and the power is, it's kind of strange, that, the, that these are meaningless, right? The useful thing about them is that they're meaningless. Um, and that frees us to move packages anywhere. The URLs aren't permanent. And you know, no one cares about what the UUID for the package is. So even if you know it changes locations or owners or whatever, um, the UUID can be the same because it doesn't mean anything. So code loading, you know, the one of the, the key things here is like how do we get code when we're loading a package, right? So you know a package manager is partly about installing stuff in the right place. That's kind of the package manager's job. But the right place depends on what the programming language, how the programming language understands how to get that code. Um, so what happens when you see import tokenize in some Julia code? Uh, well, the first thing that happens is Julia looks in the, the currently active project file, project.toml, in the depth section and looks for a key tokenize. And then it maps it's mapped to a UUID. And so now it knows that in this in this code that I'm currently loading, um, tokenize means this package with this UUID. So that that tells it the sort of the identity of tokenize, um, but it still doesn't know what version to find. So the manifest file is where all the versions are recorded, and the whole idea is that they are, you know, it's the exact versions of absolutely everything that's recorded. Um, so we go into the manifest file and we look in the depth section there and there's a mapping, there's an entry somewhere with the, the name tokenize and the UUID that we, we've looked up already. Um, and then we can look up the git tree hash of that and now we know what version. So, and that version, we, com we combine the UUID and the git tree hash um, and the name to find a path 
uh, where we can look for the code and then try to load it. So if this path, you know, tilde dot Julia packages tokenize and the slug is a five character cat hash that's computed from the UID and the tree hash. If that exists, we, that's the code we're looking for and we load it. Um, why the slug and not just like the whole tree hash or something like that? Um, well, we want reasonably short source paths. Um, there, these are somewhat user facing, you know, stack traces exist and get shown to people. And so you don't want some enormous, uh, you know, 40 character or, you know, even longer if we switch to SHA-256 uh, hash somewhere in the path names. Um, so this five character ASCII slug is, is pretty, you know, pretty innocuous. Um, also, some older systems have really short uh, path limits. This has been encountered, I've encountered this on 32-bit windows, for example. Um, all right, so one interesting thing that, that UUIDs enable uh, and that this whole system enables is that UUIDs allow us to distinguish different packages that have the same name. So you could have a single dependency graph in a project and import X means different things in different packages. So import X in one look in one dependency in the graph could, could load one package and then a different dependency, it loads a different package. Um, of course, the question is, why is that useful? Why does anyone care? Well, suppose, and this I've actually encountered this when, when working with people, uh, and we this was a problem with the earlier versions of the Julia Package Manager. Suppose someone develops a private package named Utilities that has you know useful code that they use a lot, and then someone registers a public package called Utilities. Um, you know, maybe it's an econometrics package for working with utility functions. I don't know, something like that. Um, now this can be a problem, even if you if the private person doesn't doesn't depend directly on the public utilities package, they avoid it because of the name collision. If they might not control the situation, if one of their dependencies indirectly depends on utilities, now you have two things named utilities in the same dependency graph. Um, and in some package managers, that's a problem. In the old Julia package managers, it was, um, but in the current new version, it it's not a problem, it just works. Um, and the way it is resolved is you have multiple stanzas with the same name in the manifest file, but they have different UUIDs, so it all works out. Um, so environments are something that we've seen, we see in a lot of package managers these days. So, you know, there's PyEnd and Ruby at environments and, you know, lots of, like, I think, you know, from the, from the keynote earlier, we saw that NPM was the first one to really make this a default. Um, so Julia does a similar thing. So, you know, lightweight environments per project is a, is a standard way to work. Um, and they're very lightweight because they're just these two text files. Um, and the reason that works is because the actual installation of packages goes somewhere else and is shared across many different environments. So the actual packages and other resources are installed in what we call depots. And a depot is really just a path where package resources are installed. Um, so, you know, for example, the three default ones you might have are a user installed resources one in your home directory, dot Julia, um, then an Arch specific shared system directory, and then an Arch independent shared system directory. I actually think a lot of people don't use these. Um, I certainly don't on my own personal system, but you know, why would you do, use these on your personal system? They're really more designed for shared systems where um, some system administrator wants to make a bunch of pre pre installed packages and and binaries available for people. Um, so same package of many versions. Uh, what this means is that we can actually have in the depot in one depot, lots of different versions of the same package installed. This is just standard. Um, so if you recall, the prototypical package path is depot name packages. Uh, then the package name and then the slug. Um, and that, so, you know, the slug changes for different versions because the slug is, it depends on the git tree SHA um, of, the, of the source code. So if you have different versions that have different trees, um, you can, you can have those, those can all be installed at the same time. Um, which one you use is chosen based on the content hash, which is from the manifest file. Um, it's important to note that we still only load one version of a package at once in one Julia running Julia session. Um, multiple dispatch, which is the key paradigm for the Julia language, works particularly badly with loading multiple versions of a package. So it's not the NPM situation where 
each, you know, there's many different copies of a dependency and they're all at different versions. We don't, we don't do that. Um, so content addressing. So this, this business of loading something based on the, the, the hash of its content uh, is, is commonly called content addressing. So basically it's the idea that, you know, if you want this particular content of the package, you ask for the hash of that content and that's what you get. And you can't be wrong because it's, you know, it's inherently integrity checked, right? You can, you can look at the tree and be like, am I getting the right tree? You can check that the code hasn't been tampered with um, because you can just run the same algorithm that Git, that Git uses to compute the tree hash. And if it doesn't match, then you've got the wrong code. Um, we also generally disallow modifying package content. So we didn't used to. Uh, we have a legacy exception. If there's a, in a package, there's a depth slash build.jl file, it can generate extra content in the direct depth directory. And that used to be how we built uh, binary dependencies and stuff like that. But we've been phasing that out with alternative solutions. Um, and yeah, the main use case for this was binary dependencies, but you know, we have better solutions for that now. So uh, we used to try all of the following, use locally installed libraries, uh, use a system package manager if we can find one to try to install something for us. Um, also building libraries from source. It was sort of a grab bag of all of these approaches. This was incredibly unreliable. Um, you know, on any particular system, you maybe could get this to work, but getting it to work on everybody's special snowflake of a system is just impossible. Um, and and as a as a rule, technical computing libraries are kind of the worst to build. Like they are really, really notoriously bad and hard to build. Um, you know, some of this is inherent complexity with like metaprogramming and staged stage build systems, but you know, some of it is just uh, they're old and they're complicated for no good reason. Um, the next worst thing is graphic stacks. Those are horribly, horribly difficult to build and install correctly. Um, usually there it's inherent complexity, uh, but you know, of course the very first thing that anyone wants to do in a programming language for technical computing is, you know, compute some stuff and then plot it. So these, you know, these two being particularly bad is really bad for us. So we really needed a good, reliable solution. Um, and fortunately, some very clever people worked on this and came up with a solution that took a while to build, but works like a charm. Uh, we use artifacts. They're um, immutable and content addressed, and they can be selected based on local system features, like your hardware, your operating system, your libc version, et cetera. Um, and they're pre-built pre binaries. So they're, they, you just download uh, a tarball and they're relocatable and you just unpack them and use them completely unmodified uh, after downloading them. I'm not gonna go into more detail about this, but if you wanna know more, it's really cool. Um, and there's a talk tomorrow at, uh, at UTC 1930 um, called Binary Builder using Julia's package to deliver binary libraries. Um, the, the binaries that we build are actually usable from any programming language. So other people might be interested in them, not just Julia users. Um, the system is very cool. It uses cross, cross compilation to generate binaries for all the sort of platform varieties from one common uh, dev stack, um, which means that there's much better compatibility and it's much easier to, to get to the point where you can support all of the different platforms. Um, immutability is an interesting side effect of content addressing, right? If you're addressing something by content, you know, you can't change it. it ha you've, you've identified it by the content already, um, but it has its own side benefits, right? So one of the things I mentioned already is that you can verify the integrity of any everything that's installed. Um, but another one is that you can download and in install things in any order and in particular in parallel, right? So all you need to do is look at the registry, figure out what you need to install in advance. And we make sure that the registry has enough information to figure out the exact versions of everything. Um, so you don't have to run code like you do in Python to figure out what versions you're actually, uh, what, what things you depend on and what versions you might have. So there's none of this trying to install something and then backing out. You know in advance you can compute what you need. Um, then you can just download everything in parallel. It's just downloading a bunch of tarballs, uh, put them in the right place, just unpack them all, and then you're ready to go. Um, so that is quite quick. And you may remember from the demo, you saw it twice. So 
um, you know, it, it was pretty quick to install things. Um, registries, I haven't talked about how Julia pack, Julie's package registries work, but uh, there's a talk about it tomorrow. Um, I, I'm running out of time, but Julia's package system is federated, which is pretty, pretty handy. Uh, there's a general registry of open packages, but there's other registries can be installed and used. So companies often have private registries of packages internally. Uh, and research labs will often have sort of their own public registries of packages that is just their own research code. Um, UUIDs are really helpful here. Um, they allow you to smoothly migrate packages from private to public, and you can even mix private and public versions of the same package that are in different registries, uh, and that it just works. Um, but there is a downside. So back in February this year, um, this dependency of confusion attack that I imagine a lot of people will be familiar with was announced. Um, I, you know, they were, there's probably people understand how this works. If you don't, you can look it up. Uh, basically, if you can, you know, make publish a, a malicious package in an open source registry with the same name as a private package, you can trick people into loading your malicious code. Um, one downside of it being so easy to mix public and private versions of Julia packages is that it, it makes this possible as well. Um, you don't just need to know the name, you also need to know the UUID, but that's still bad because UUIDs aren't designed to be private. So we're very interested in possible mitigation strategies. Uh, thank you for watching the talk. Um, you should definitely check out other Julia PKG talks. So I mentioned them earlier, package registries for the Julia package manager and binary builder using Julia's package to deliver binary libraries. <laughs> Thanks, Stefan. And uh, we actually had a question coming up on uh, the element IO. All right, so, cool. What if you have a Julia package that can be optimized, say, for a particular processor? Uh, so we do. Uh, the, the binary builder does support uh, variations down to the processor. Um, not every, every binary dependency cares or takes advantage of that. So you don't have to shard down to that level, but you can shard down to that level. Um, and we even have support for things like that, you know, are kind of extra, like what your what type of GPU you might have. Um, so all this, the system is used for pre built, uh, you know, GPU libraries as well. And the result is a little crazy. It's, it's kind of astonishing that you can just install stuff and like have a working GPU stack in 30 seconds. It's wild because, um, you know, normally getting a working GPU stack is like a couple of days worth of effort the first time around. Cool. Yeah, there's another question. Um, how are bug fixes and security fixes propagated to packages that depend on a package if the dependencies are locked in place? Uh, well, I mean, so it's the works the same way as any other system with lock files, right? It's, uh, you know, the lock file tells you what you did run. It doesn't tell you what you have to run. So um, we have a mechanism for yanking versions that are insecure. Um, there's not really a good way to deliver that messaging to the end user. Um, but, you know, if you do updates, you won't get the, the bad version. Um, in hosted solutions, uh, you know, like there's a Julia, Julia Hub is a, a hosted cloud computing solution that people use for Julia jobs. There you can actually get proactive alerts like that this that there's a security issue. But we can't really do that on on end systems, right? You have to talk to some some server before you can be notified. But it would be good to have some way of notifying people. Cool. I don't see any more questions coming right now, but I hope you'll be available like on Element.io or all these chat platforms. Yeah, absolutely. I'm on, I'm on Element and uh, I'd be happy to answer questions if anybody has And uh, the package registries talk is also going to happen actually in this room, so. Right, it's in this room in a little less than an hour, I think. Um, yeah. Yeah, awesome. So, great, okay. thank you so much. Thank you.